Oh, yeah, Ted, man. Teddy Bruschi with a uh, uh, 50th birthday key lime oh, pie. Oh, you got a key lime pie. <laughs> <laughs> I love key lime pie, man. Huh? Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the Punch Drunk Podcast. I'm Paul Brooks, joined always by Michael. What's up? Joey. How's it going? And Mike Lane. Howdy. And joining us on the couch in studio is someone who needs no introduction, but you know what? I'm going to get one because you deserve Let's it. Let's do it. You yeah. deserve it. <laughs> Three-time Super Bowl champion, NFL Comeback Player of the Year in 2005, twice second-team All-Pro, Pro Bowler 2004, a member of the College Football Hall of Fame, New England Patriots All 2000s team, New England Patriots All Dynasty team, New England Patriots 50th anniversary team, and a member of the New England Patriots Hall of Fame. Please welcome number 54, Teddy Bruschi. Hey, that's a lot of stuff you said there. <laughs> Teddy, thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule to join us. Um, I know that we are. Uh, I have a much better studio than ESPN, so <laughs> That's, you know we kind of get my, my little home setup. Yeah. I've got I've got all that. Yeah, I've got to turn on like seven different lights and <laughs> yeah. turn on the phone and there's a ring light and I got background lights. It's uh, you know everybody on ESPN has their shelves behind them and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I See, try to. I try. We to, like that home yeah. feel effect. Yeah, uh, and in honor of one of your studio, one of your partners. <laughs> We grabbed Matt Hasselbeck's helmet, so we got his here. Yeah, right the here Boston too. College yeah. yet yeah. strong here. That's his actual helmet, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get right into uh, some things here. You were um, one of the state of California's uh, best football players in high school. Yeah, the, well, they actually did uh, at the at, at two thousand the year two thousand. They did of like a top one hundred football players at yeah. that time. I was actually number one. Number yeah. one. Yeah. So yeah, you can. And, and when you think about it, <laughs> and when you think about being the number one player out of Massachusetts, you go, holy hell, that's a pretty good accomplishment. But California, my God. Um, then you get recruited to Arizona. You had a couple of schools recruited you. BYU, I think, was one. Yeah, Arizona and Arizona. Washington State. So I wanted to play in the Pac-10. Yeah. It was the Pac-10 back then. Now it's the Pac-12. And um, did not go to Washington State. I, I sort of leaned toward uh, living in Tucson, Arizona, rather than Pullman, Washington. Really? <laughs> I thought it was a, a better climate. And uh, you go around to the, you know, you trip there in February for those recruiting visits. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's pretty nice there in February. Well, certainly a wise choice. Yes. For a, a number of reasons. A little more sunny. <laughs> for a number of reasons. The weather, that's one. But your, your incredible college football career, uh, and you ultimately uh, met your wife. Yeah, the, the, yeah. So I'll say I'll but I mean, joke with you and say they've got good-looking volleyball players. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where that's where Heidi and met. Yeah, Heidi and I met. She was a volleyball. player. That's fantastic. I was a football player. Um, yeah. So the good thing is, um, you did a great service for Arizona by playing because you you basically forced them to retire number sixty-eight because of what you did. Number sixty-eight. That that number kind of sucks. I know right? that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that is on the countdown. <laughs> always give me that? a hard time too. Moss and Hasselback. <laughs> sixty-eight. Or Rex is always like sixty-eight. That's the ugliest number. What did they just give that to you? I wore it in high school, <laughs> and so I was like, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just keep it in college. I wanted eighty-six in high school. But they said you're not you're not going to be catching the ball. I was like an offensive guard and a defensive tackle, so 68. All right, flip them, and I kept them. And I kept yeah, them. well, that's good because nobody <laughs> can wear 68 at Arizona anymore, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> um, so you played defensive end. I did defensive end. No linebacker at all. Never took a drop in my life until I got to the Patriots. Yes, that's amazing. So yeah. now you get through your college and. You know, the, between the Morris Trophy, the Pac-10 Defensive Player of the Year in 95, uh, two-time consensus All-American, uh, three-time All-Pac-10, ridiculous numbers, illust uh, just an illustrious career in college. You go in the third round to the Patriots. Now, you're a West right. Coast guy playing for Arizona. Now your first year is under Bill Parcells. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. What was your thoughts about coming to the Patriots? 
Well, at first it was, I, I would, everyone would ask you, where do you want to get drafted, Brooksy? And I'm like, I don't care, I don't care. But the question kept coming, so I was, I would answer it, okay, somewhere close. And I actually got drafted to the furthest possible place <laughs> rather than, you know, Miami or, or New England. And it was, uh, it was the New England Patriots. And I was dating Heidi at the time, and literally I told her, babe, I just got drafted by New England Patriots. And she said, where's that? <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're West Coast people, yeah. and, and Heidi was, you know, lived in Tucson. She didn't, she wasn't into the NFL or anything like that, especially the AFC East. So, yeah, Boston, that's where I'm going. And it was, it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a change coming out here. I mean, I mean, climate change, culture change. Heidi had a little, had to get used to it a little bit, but it was, it didn't take me long to just appreciate what was out here in terms of New England and the people and and the passion they had for the Patriots. Didn't take you long to uh, make an impact with the New England Patriots. I mean, right, almost right away. Right. Well, shoot, my rookie year, you know, that's when, I mean, like I, like I was saying, my first linebacker meeting, Brooksy, my rookie year, Al Groh was my coach. Dante Skarnecchia was the assistant linebackers coach, and I was the only one in there that they drafted as a linebacker, which I had no idea how to play. They were going over cover two, and they were trying to explain – um, what you do when you recognize pass, okay, the corner's got the half, you know, all this stuff, and they're, they're jamming and getting deep and all this stuff, and then all of a sudden, linebackers drop to the hook, and I raised my hand, and I said, where's that? I mean, I had no concept of flat curl hook, right. deep third halves, or anything like that, because all I did at Arizona was rush. So <laughs> I had to learn how to, how to play linebacker and learn other areas of the field rather than going forward. Do you know how to blitz? That's, what they want. <laughs> that's it. That's that's it. it. <laughs> I just rushed. Yeah. I rushed at Arizona. I mean, 52 sacks, and that's all I did was, if it was a pass, I rushed. If the hip of the tight end or the tackle went down, I just shuffled, and it was a run, and I played it that way. I mean, it's tough enough for people to even try try to make the NFL and you made it playing a position you never played. I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, they, they formed a cactus package because I was from Arizona. So Al Groh wanted to get me on the, on the, on the field somehow, some way. So they called it cactus and I came in and I played defensive tackle because Willie McGinnis and Chris Slade were on the outside and they didn't want me rushing from there from those, but it was because it because we had those guys. So I'd come in and be a rusher from a three technique at times but then when we played odd then i'd float around and do pass rush games with either of slade or mcginnis or or henry tank thomas i think was the nose tackle at mm -hmm. that time or or but uh, that's that's how they ended up getting me in and i also started playing special teams so now you got bill parcells there and now i think there was only one year right because he went to the super right. bowl and lost to the right. packers we lost to the packers and he's out belichick comes in Jets. yeah no it was pete carroll pete, pete carroll, carroll pete that's carroll. right i forgot now, I thought, I thought it was going to be Belichick, too, yeah. because on the plane ride home, Parcells wasn't on the plane, and Belichick was going around to various people. Right. He'd say he would talk to us saying, you know, be very encouraging about the year that you had. I remember him talking to me. He was like, Teddy, you had a good rookie year. You just keep working. We're going to be good around here. And, and I thought, well, there goes, he must be. there goes our next head coach. Yeah. So I watch Bill, and he goes to Lori Malloy and other guys like that. I'm like, okay, Belichick's going to be the head coach. But then the whole Kraft, Parcells yep. thing went on, I think, and Parcells made sure Belichick was you know, with him and loyal with him, and he went over to the Jets. And then, so you played for Pete Carroll. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really how that's really where I played a lot where I played linebacker. Yeah. Like Pete. I mean, Bo Pelini was the linebacker coach. And really I, I learned a lot because I mean that's where I mean, all I did, like I said, I would did that little specialty package for Parcells and, and Al Groh and Belichick and the coaches that were there. And then Pete Carroll came in and then all of a sudden I started learning like all the intricacies of lining up off the ball, reading guards you know, playing the well linebacker at the time, which was covered up by a three technique. It was an under defense, a 4-3. So I really had to learn under Pete and Bo Pelini. Pete was a real good defensive-minded He was, yeah. Positional was. coach on all positions or just basically defense? I, th I thought it was defense, yeah. And, yeah. you know, shoot, I think we went 10-6, and 9-7, 8-8, and eight and, eight, and then Pete Carroll got fired. Um, 
Pete, it was just like night and day, guys. When when Pete, when you go from Bill Parcells to Pete Carroll, it's like Bill Parcells is old school, hard nose, and Pete really relies on a lot of his players to you know take the leadership role. Pete lo loved to name the days, like yeah. uh, Turnover Thursday, No Repeat Friday. Um, I forget what Wednesday was called, but Monday never had a name. You know, the day after a game. And I learned after Pete left, he ended up calling Monday, Tell the Truth Monday. And I think that was his problem when he was here. We didn't have Tell the Truth Monday. And mm. he finally learned that we need to start holding these players accountable in front of the whole team. And, of course, we had those sessions all the time with Parcells and then Belichick when he came in. But Pete really started to come into his own as a head coach at USC. And then he went to Seattle, and that's when they had a success and won the Super Bowl. So you got kind of like Parcells. Pretty tough. Yeah. Hard nose. Pete Carroll must have felt like a little bit of a vacation. Yeah, I mean. But I mean, learning. Right. And learning and things like that. But I really, And now you go to Belichick. And then back to Belichick, which I knew how that would be. So, I mean, if you think about it, all three are Super Bowl winning head coaches now yeah. that you look back. And I think what Pete was best for me was, you know, teaching me how to eventually become a leader and then, you know, also how to play linebacker. That was, that was, that was instrumental for me. But then my found, foundation was laid by Parcells. So when Belichick came in, I really didn't. I really didn't have any type of you know problems dealing with the discipline that he brought back what an amazing career though 13 years with the patriots all with the patriots you never had an agent did you i did the oh, first year the you first did contract the first uh three years i did have an agent coming out a good friend of mine that's still that's still around bert kenurk is a good friend of mine he's a lawyer out of tucson so he helped me um with that also so th i think i did three contracts by myself but uh, mm. yeah, and that got me through uh, the, the bulk of my career. Bert yeah. Knurk, what a great name! Yeah, <laughs> that's my guy. <laughs> so you got you had three Super Bowls. You played for th what I will say probably three Hall of Fame head coaches sure. in the yeah. game. Yeah, uh, great career. Um, you're the first player. Now you still may be. I, I tried to look this one up to see if you still hold it, but you're the first player in NFL history to return four consecutive interceptions for touchdowns. Yeah, over the yeah, so that was one year that tailed off into the next year. So my four straight interceptions I took back to the house. Um yeah. Oakland, Miami, of course. Yeah. Detroit, um, Philadelphia. I remember that. Yeah, that was in twenty three. So two thousand two oh three. Yeah, 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 that was it. Right. Right. <clears throat> That's uh, that's something. Now, before I know everybody else wants to get into the questions, there's a couple of things that I know about you that people, some people may not know. Um, you're an accomplished musician, saxophonist. Yeah, I can play the sax. Man. Is it true that you played with the Boston Pops? Okay. Oh, no. Didn't play with the Pops. I played at Symphony Hall with the Longy School of Music. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. So it was a, it was a charity benefit for the school, and it was a... I think it was a quartet that I played in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was that was nerve wracking, man. I had to I had to really get back in and uh you know, get back in my musical background. I was in the band before I played football. So I played clarinet, then alto saxophone. High school I ended up I ended up uh, being in the I ended up playing J V games and then I'd play in the band for the varsity games, change into my, my band uniform. And yeah, I was, I was wow. in the stands playing in the band, man. Yeah. And there's other things that you and I have gone, because uh, we ended up coaching together in high school. We ended up going yeah. to the bowling alley. And how many times have you bowled a perfect 300 in 10 pin? Oh, that's just once. 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 You bowled a perfect yeah, 300. Yeah, I bowled a 280 something once. I missed it another time. But uh, yeah, I bowled a perfect game. That was June 10th. 2013 man yeah i remember yeah. did you get a ring for that <laughs> no it wasn't in league i was gonna say what's a better ring no the i don't know <laughs> <or, laughs> this is it right here can i see this one no it wasn't uh, it wasn't in league so you don't get a ring for that just sort of i was at north bowl man i love going to north bowl yeah I got my own locker there and everything <laughs> yeah yeah i don't spot, <laughs> <That's my> spot. <laughs> i think i bought like a, a 160 that's that's pretty where i'm much where i'm at um you own your own bowling shoes? Any of you guys own? Your I own used to shoes? have my own bowling shoes and a bowling ball. 
got to have your own bowling shoes. That's one of the best things anyone can own, in my opinion. Yeah. You should bowling You shoes. should probably have everything. You kind of look the part. You know, you got to look the part. You can't just go in and wrench shoes. You can shoes look the part or... and still suck at it. You know yeah. what I mean? And well, that make me a better bowler, though? You get your own shoes and it's... I would say just hygiene. It, it'd help you out. Oh, yeah. you know, I know they that's spray the why shoes. There's no, nothing wrong with spray. You know, they spray the shoes and stuff. But it's just feel, you just feel a little bit cooler with your own shoes, man. I like that. Something shoes. about wearing like shoes that have been worn by like 50 people. 50? 50? <laughs> try 500, man. Yeah, try 50 in a day. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I'm holding the ring up, and this is from the first Super Bowl. 2001, yeah. You, you won three of them. What is your most favorite or most prize possession of the, out of the rings i, I would say the favorite? first one the that first you're holding one. yeah because um i mean that's the one where um we won our first when we sort of broke through and just changed the way people thought about the entire new england patriots organization because i mean this is this was a baseball slash basketball town yeah I mean, celtics winning championships the red sox <clears throat> you know they just the, this little passion they had with the red sox so I mean, I remember a girl coming up to me. The story I love to tell is like, uh, hey, my grandfather wanted me to thank you guys. And I was like, oh, tell him you're welcome because why, why, why are you thanking us? He said, no, no, no. My grandfather said he could die a happy man now. Mm. And, and I was like, yeah. that's when I started to learn what it, what it was like around here, what it was about in terms of... Uh, well, you start also realizing that people around here going through the 70s, I mean, the tough ones with, you know, when, when Grogan was playing or even before that with Plunkett playing and rich history with some f real famous Patriot players but some real struggles through those seasons too and a lot of the fan base was like you gotta be kidding there was a time when nobody around here could watch the team locally on TV because they never had a sellout and there was sellout laws oh, so back they then. wouldn't play it so you couldn't okay. play it you couldn't just watch anything so people were possibly going to New Hampshire or Rhode Island just to see the team on on TV because yeah. they wouldn't even sell out yeah, and I started to learn the history of everything, why there were there are still trickling of Giants fans around here because Yeah, one next to you. Yeah, really. Ugh. Okay. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do? At least I'm from New York. <laughs> yeah. At least I'm from New York. I'm Full like disclosure, he is from New York. Giants I mean, fan. it's it's so it's it's so generational here. I mean, in nineteen sixty when the when the team was originated, I mean you've got you've got nobody so it's it's still giants out here i think i believe someone would tell me and then all of a sudden all right so grandfathers are making sure their sons are giants fans you know and then then it trickles down from sons to yeah. you know fathers to sons and that's how it happens but i think we're we're weeding that out now with the success that with the, the six <laughs> championships which is i'd like, say so good. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> i think you pushed anyone from being yeah. a giants yeah. fan in this area that was like you know 18 <laughs> or under you know what I mean? right it sort of right. sort of clean cleanses the problem <laughs> <laughs> <If it was. clears throat> i guess I'll, i'm gonna start so we're we doing questions from us now or what are we doing all right yeah. so um i asked logan the same question and i i always find it interesting is what, like, when did you realize before college that you were could be at the next level and you were like all right I'm, I'm actually pretty good at this like i'm this is what i want to do before I can, college, I can do it yeah before college i never did um i Not never I, ne I i i yeah so we're talking in high school and i really wasn't even i mean I mean, this is how I started playing football. I went to freshman orientation in Roseville, California, and I saw a couple of buddies from eighth grade, and I walk, they, they motioned me over, and they said, hey, man, how you doing? And I said, all oh, good. I'll, I'll sit next to you for freshman orientation. And I looked by their, their feet, and they had cleats in a cooler. And I said, what are those for? And they said, we're going to try for the football team. You should come. I said, all right. So I went out. And the next day I had my old Avia tennis shoes. I didn't even have cleats. You know what I mean? I had a t-shirt as a jersey. So I just started playing. And I just loved it when I put on pads and I could hit people and it didn't hurt, Michael. So that it, I really just fell in love with it. And then my after my junior year, my coach came up to me and handed me a letter. I said, what is this? And he said, it's a recruiting letter. And upper, up in the upper left-hand corner was a gold helmet from UCLA. <laughs> and it was the first ever recruiting letter I got, and then I was like, "Oh shit! I can I can actually go to college for free." <laughs> wow! I was like, "All right, let's go." So then I started having the goal of playing college football, and so you get to college football, and then when I was named the, uh, I think after my redshirt sophomore year, I was named like a second team All American there, and then I was like, maybe I can turn this into something. Yeah. So that, I just sort of took it as sort of a incremental step-by-step -step process right yeah. to piggyback on michael though but did you ever feel as though or did anybody ever tell you you may have been undersized all the time yeah all the time i mean i started out i mean 
after that freshman orientation, I went to practice and coach brings us up. Coach Don Hicks, I still remember. He, he, everybody remembers their freshman football coaches. I mean, everybody does. So he's br- brought us all up and he's like, all right, guys, let's have a good day of practice. Everybody break up to your positional groups. And everybody broke up and I stood right there and I said, coach, where do you want me to go? And he said, go with the lineman. And that's how I ended up being a defensive tackle and an offensive guard. But with that, I'm six one or whatever, six feet at the time, a freshman and all that stuff. I'm undersized in terms of collegiate linemen. So junior year, senior year, as I start to get recruited, it's I'm undersized for a defensive end in college. Mm-hmm. And then coming out of um, the NFL, a defensive end coming out that I was 6'1", 240, 245, that's undersized for NFL standards. So I was always undersized, sort of, yeah. the category, yeah. Now, being from California, I got to ask, was that Snow Angel and the Raiders game the first one you ever did? Because you created <laughs> that celebration. Because now you see everyone do it on the turf now. I see it every Sunday. You know? Yeah, well, the shoot, I, I, I mean, that sliding you in the snow that. was mine. Lonnie Paxton created that. I mean, he was our long snapper, really, right? Yeah. So oh, he yeah, went out yeah, there yeah. and did that. I mean, I slid in the snow in Miami. I don't know why. I mean, I didn't realize, I didn't know snow or bad weather games until I came out here, but I just sort of felt good about it because... I thought defensively we always had the advantage. So we loved the bad weather games. I mean, we just had that mentality of, I mean, I remember playing the Colts one time and it was one of the playoff games. And just as you start to walk out, it's, it was a it was a nice day. But then the snow started coming down as pregame warmups were happening. And then there was a, I mean, there was an operations guy that saw me. He said, RKK's got a got a, a direct line upstairs. I mean Robert Kraft. I mean RKK because <laughs> like, he dialed up the snow for Peyton Manning. You know, so yeah. we loved it when it was bad weather. Yes. Did you guys have a feeling that during that Raiders game that you guys had the edge, obviously, with that snow? Because we thought. We thought, yeah, but the, I mean, those guys played so well, you know, in the snow. It was really us coming. Yeah, back. he kicked me out of the basement. Yeah. I'll never forget it. I was ten years old, and he wouldn't let anyone watch. He had to watch it alone. Oh, really? Yeah, when, little... when that field goal went up, that's you know me. Watch it looks like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We could only watch once the field goal went in. And then we, we, were good. we got behind, <clears throat> and I mean, we we thought, I mean, these guys from California, they're going to hate this stuff. But I mean, they had, I mean, Jerry Rice was on that team. Yeah. I mean, Gannon was on that team. Woodson, Beekert, they had guys that were hard nosed. So, I mean, we got a couple breaks. You know, we got a big sure. break in terms of that tuck roll, but. Uh, we still, uh, the, the weather didn't help us there. I mean, we had a, Adam Vinatieri had to make that superhuman kick. Do you think that was a fumble? I thought it was. I thought it was at first. I mean, you look at it and it's like, boom, as yep. a defense, you're like, you start walking out. But um, I think we had an example earlier on that same year. And then you got that feeling like, oh, man, they're looking at it. Yep. And you never know what's going to happen once they get under the hood, Joey, to look at that, to look at the plays. So we got another chance. We're never getting out here alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That may have been the feeling. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had a couple questions for you. Um, one play or game that you will never forget. <laughs> one play, Detroit versus Detroit in th- Thanksgiving Day game. It was a pick six. Um, I think it was 2002 was the year I intercepted Joey Harrington and took him back to the house. But for me, as a player, it was a progression of finally being a linebacker because so many things had to happen that was so complex that that Belichick and his staff wanted you to do. Reading a formation, okay, that's different than the huddle called, so we got to adjust, and I adjusted. Reading a, a slide protection of the offensive line, and then as I'm blitzing, changing your assignment as you're blitzing, and then dropping out, which I wasn't used to doing, and then reading pattern read as you drop out. So many complex things had to go with that. I intercepted it as I looked back. It was, the ball was there, and then I took it to the house. That was really a play for me that, okay, now I'm a linebacker, and I feel comfortable. About That's like the I'm moment doing. you were like, I put it together. Yeah. I'm yeah, good here. Yeah, in terms of nostalgia, <laughs> uh, the, the play, the interception in the snow. And then you just kept picking one. people off and turning them back to the house because yeah. that was during your streak. Yeah, that was right during <laughs> my streak. It was. It was. But in terms of nostalgia and like a moment, that Miami moment was incredible because of everyone throwing up the snow in the wow. air. 
And I have re- remember uh, Mike Vrabel come up to me and said, "Look what you did." You know? <laughs> <laughs> look what you look you around. Did. It was like it was so awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, shittiest stadium or fan base that you played in front of. Well, when you talk about shittiest fans, you think they're shitty because they're so tough and they're right? so passionate. Yeah, yeah. so passionate. Um, well, the, the stadium had to be the old vet in Philadelphia when they had ripples in the AstroTurf. That was pretty tough. That was that was a bad facility that they ended up fixing. They've got a nice place now. I would say, I would say in terms of fans, the Jets fans are always tough. And I don't call them shitty. I just call them tough. I mean, because, I mean, they're always in your ear and they're always, I mean, they had some bad teams there too, but they were yeah. still cheering their teams on. Yeah, and I know that, a, lot that, of, yeah. a lot of Jet fans. Yeah, and that's, what, that's what really I respect. Your team sucks. They're not winning. They're getting beat, but you're still there. You know, they have that element of it. Buffalo also has that element of it too. For the Jet fans I knew, like I know, the Patriots games were like the two games they really got up for. It was just like the page, we're playing the Patriots. Yeah. We got to beat them. Yeah, and, those, then, and then they just never did. Yeah, there was a good <laughs> span of shoot. I mean, a long time where everyone just got up for us. I mean, I think it was after. I mean, oh one comes and you think it's a fluke, but you go oh three, you go oh four. I mean, everybody's now gunning for you through oh seven when you're when you're undefeated going into the Super Bowl. So there's a yeah. We don't of, have to talk about that. Yeah, it's <laughs> that was luck. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> A lot of things happen there. That's bad luck. Injuries, but yeah. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of lucky plays in Super Bowls. You watch them. Hey, what one not, thing? Not one for the thing, Patriots. Yeah, one thing, Bill. Yeah, one thing, Bill always says to win championships: good players, good coaches, good fortune. And you're telling yep. me, I mean, the Tuck roll was good fortune. I mean, drafting Brady was good fortune. You know, so, a lot, a lot of luck. Edelman's catch was good fortune. There you go. <laughs> that was yeah. skill. The yeah. fact that, that was the, skill. the Seahawks uh, didn't run. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, that was luck. There's a definite element of everyone, <laughs> everyone winning, having a little bit of luck on one of their games to get to the Super Bowl or win it. Yeah, yeah. Like, do you have any like behind the scenes stories or something that the average fan might not know about the NFL? Behind the scenes stories about, I would say just how about this how, about how fun the tr- the training room can be. You really? know what I mean? When when it's sort of a hangout place where mm-hmm. you go in there and guys are messing around. I remember Jimmy Whalen, our head trainer, but I mean he I mean he was a great guy to go in there and spend time with and just sit in there and, and a lot of guys, even though you sometimes you're hurt and it and it sucks, but guys will just go in there just to hang out. There are various little faction places where you can just have a, a lot of camaraderie in the NFL. The training room, the equipment room, the stretch line is 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 always super fun. One of the best one of the best guys had to have in the stretch line, believe it or not, was Matt Light. And he would do Harry Carey imitations. He would just sing country songs. He would always pull pranks on a lot of guys. I mean, Vrabel, the linebacker crew, a lot happened in stretch lines. I mean, even when we're at Fian and we're coaching at Fian, I would always try to mess around with you guys during the stretch line. You know what I mean? Because it's almost like we're about to start. We're about to have practice, but you're just warming up right now so you can, like, talk about school and and ask you you know, what was going on through the course of your day. Have you ever had, like, a heated practice where, like, where you were involved in, where, like, two guys, like, like went off on each other? And I mean, they had, I remember a stretch of, like, three weeks where I fought scout team offensive linemen every single week. <laughs> <laughs> and it was they just bring new guys in, and they don't know the tempo, and we're in the middle of a season, and guys are a little bit hurt, and this guy's trying to stay on the team and go 100%. And there was always a move that I just did. I mean, you're a fighter. You know these moves. But these guys got face masks on, right? So how do you get under the face masks to get a good blow? I would always do the two-hand shiver right under the face mask and it stun them right but then as i'd go back i'd lift it up and then you come with the up and up and you bow right on there blood, <laughs> ju- blood just coming on jerseys after that yeah that's that's the move that i always love to I love to use it worked well it worked a lot of times too yeah it was a good little move so bow lift bow 
right underneath. That was a move I love to do in those fights. <laughs> oh, he's talking about fights. You ever see two guys fight that you just wanted to stay out the way? It was Logan Mankins and Richard Seymour. <laughs> he talked about that he when did. he was sitting in that talk about When that. they would go at it, oh, no, no. Like a lot of times, oh, let's go get in there. We got to get in between those guys. Oh, I'm not getting in there. <laughs> <laughs> too much, too much. Too much, too, too much too much human <laughs> in there <laughs> wow you're talented in many things uh if you weren't an nfl player what would you do as a profession uh, if i wasn't an nfl player man i i don't know i mean i i i'm i've been blessed enough to where i don't know i haven't had a real job fellas i mean just this this espn thing is just a blessing still that i get to talk about es talk about football on espn um i don't know if i would have went to college either my parents probably couldn't afford to send me to college so do i go to a quick junior college and see what i could do after that Am I a teacher and a coach, something like that, you know, to stay in the sport or something like that? I, th I think that that's maybe what, where I would have gone. Um, but football was just a fortunate blessing for me that I just ended up being good at, you know, and it helped me open a lot of doors. Wow. Today, I want to talk about, um, first of all, the other thing we didn't mention is you also ran the Boston Marathon twice. Three times. Three times. I ran it three wow. times. Yeah. So yeah, for Teddy's team. I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I want to get into that. I, I want to try to go back to the good, uh, and with that comes a little tough time, a little, yeah. little tough moment health-wise yeah. in your career. Um, you just finished the Super Bowl, went to the Pro Bowl, come back from the Pro Bowl, and a couple of days later, you had a stroke. Right. Um, that kind of obviously – you know your your health now comes before anything um where did that would that make you go through and tell us a little bit about that yeah it made me made me realize if you know how, how precious life is that um you know my doctor told me if the blood clot went a little bit to the left or the right and and, and went in different places in your brain you might have died you know that's always something to hear but mm. i just didn't know football was possible again you know it's it's I mean, I always, always thought stroke was for your grandma or yeah. your grandfather or something like that, guys. I never thought it was you possible age, for right. someone. Yeah, I was 31. 31. I was 31. So that happening to me, it's like you're – I think I I got I, – I came back – to play, but I recovered more physically, you know, quicker physically than I did mentally. Because mm -hmm. I went through that entire year, like thinking, am I doing the right thing? You know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're almost like, I was almost like a guinea pig in terms of, so I had the stroke and they put a, they put a device in my heart because I had a hole in my heart. Um, that they thought the blood clot traveled to a PFO, a patent for amino valley. So they thought the blood clot uh, traveled through and went up to my brain. So let's close the hole um, and we think you can play football again. But every other week that you play, you're going to come to Massachusetts General Hospital and we're going to do this bubble test on you to see if the device is still holding well where they put these bubbles in your arm and it goes through your heart and you're literally looking at your heart on a monitor and you're seeing all of these bubbles go on one side and you're seeing if any go off to the other to the other side of the heart the other mm. ventricle i think it is and it's like if that goes if the, you see any bubbles going that way oh it's over you're not playing you can't do it do anything so it was tough it was nerve-wracking and that's why I, I, like just recently i see damar hamlin coming back because yeah. um and everything that's going through his head because mcdermott said he's going through a little bit more mentally than he is physically and i know exactly what he's talking about in terms of damar dealing with everything that he has to deal with and also like family members and loved ones their opinions on what he should do because uh, playing football is one thing but then your medical health yeah. brain heart right brain heart now your family's going to come in and tell you hey Yes, no, maybe, and all of that's you know that's going through his mind, and that's what it did with mine too. That was the same. The year you had it in 05, you came back to play like towards the end of that season. Yeah, the same year, the same year, the same season. Yeah, yeah, that was um, I, that's one of the first times I ever saw Bill like say, "Well, are you serious?" Like caught him off guard in terms of 
Bill first gave me the the first option. He's like, Teddy, why don't you just take the whole year off? You know, come yeah. back next year, and and you know, we'll we'll still be here for you. But I just started getting better, and I can't, so they put me on first on PUP, which would keep me out the first six weeks. And I came into him about I think it might have been week two or week three, and I said, Bill, I'm going to be ready to go for this year. And he looked at me like it was something he just didn't expect, and. You know, I, I just knew it, 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 it had to be at some point. So why not do it as, as fast as I could? And I did. And, you know, it, it all worked out. In the end. Which is entirely the way you played your, your football career. Crazy. Like, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Insanely crazy. That's the way you play the game, though. Yeah, I remember a sign that the sign that the crew made the the, the full tilt full time. Yeah. That's what I was. You know, even coming back from the stroke, even though, you know, I was a little messed up in the head, you know, in terms of everything like Heidi didn't want me to come back at first. So that was something I had to deal with. Yeah. It's like you know, you've won three Super Bowls. What are we doing here, Teddy? Uh, you know, her dad was like, What else do you have to prove? And then my brother's like, They can't stop you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, Go get their asses back, you know what I mean? so uh but you know that's that's families you know they they love you and they want you to be good but i i ended up coming back and playing the first year and that's just it just worked out so this leads us into probably one of the best things locally around here uh you have established teddy's team yeah uh, just a tremendous uh charitable organization teddy's team and then just recently you opened up and you partnered with mgh yeah. um the institute of health and you opened up what is it teddy's team center of excellence yeah center of excellence for stroke recovery yeah can you tell us a little bit about that that's over in charlestown yeah that's yeah. um that's a place where stroke survivors can go and g continue their rehabilitation process because my whole thing with teddy's team is about one providing information and awareness of the warning signs of stroke which is what i did not know and the acronyms be fast i mean balance difficulties eyesight changes, a facial droop, arm weakness, slurred speech, time to call 911. Those are the BFAST, that's the BFAST acronym, and those are the warning signs of stroke. And then also giving survivors a means for a comeback. So we have a comeback assistance program where I have, where I have we have funded various rehabilitation devices or uh, therapy sessions. And then now with the Center of Excellence for Stroke Recovery, it's actually a place when insurance runs out people can go and continue their treatment for free because it's also wow. there's a learning aspect of it through mgh where therapists learn while they're in school and also teachers teach you know they teach them how the therapist to be better therapists and how to do that so it's something that has been a long time coming i mean teddy's team now we've been around since you know our first team in 2006 so this was really something great for us to start and you you raised some incredible like almost eight nine million dollars. Yeah, we're up over uh, ten million dollars. Ten million dollars. Yeah. yeah, so we've done a lot. That's of amazing. That's amazing. Congratulations! But we're going to also post this. But uh, for those who are more interested in even donations or getting involved, Teddy's Team dot org. That's Teddy's T E D Y S Team dot org. Yeah. And we're going to post that. Thanks, Brooksy. When yeah. we do this, yeah. um, that's just amazing. Uh, what you've accomplished and you know thanks for taking the time however there's one other thing okay before we get ready um can you crawl over to joey and get that All right, it'll take me forever to get it <laughs> but we also know something that uh, our fans don't know they could look it up certainly and know that the date but <coughs> you got a pretty big day coming up like friday oh yes <laughs> that's right? right yes so <clears throat> what do we got so on behalf of now this, we're going out on a limb. This is Joey's research. No home, I saw I saw something a post. It wasn't homemade by Heidi, but it is from White's Bakery. So we want to okay. we want to present. I love White's Bakery. All right, right. so yeah, we want to present Bakery, yeah. Ted, yeah, Teddy Brewski with a, a 50th birthday key lime. Oh, pie. you got a key lime pie! <laughs> yeah. I love key lime pie, man. Huh? Oh, thanks, guys. Let me right. show that there. Yeah, right there. there you go. I love key lime pie. I don't know what it is. I, I've gone, I've even, I've gone to places 
you know, just for the key lime pie. So what we, I mean, the Super Bowl was in Florida once. I, I, I Googled where the best key lime pie is, okay? I mean, I've been on Gold Belly trying to get the best key lime wow. pies and all that stuff. Actually, Joe's Restaurant in Las Vegas has got a great key lime pie. So all over the country, I've searched for them. But thanks, God. Well, hopefully if you like it, it's, it's White's Bakery. So we'll give a shout out to oh, White's yeah. Bakery. Thanks, White. Uh, <laughs> and thank you very much for supplying uh, Teddy Bruschi uh, with the uh, key lime pie. And also... Um, got a few things here. Uh, so Michael and Joey are called the Brooks Brothers in their boxing. So we're gonna give you a Brooks Brothers hat. Oh, sweet! Uh, and got T-shirts for everybody for the Punch Drunk Podcast. Everybody in the family. We got the three boys. Uh, Heidi, Heidi has the smaller size I one. I love this. Thanks, guys. And. Uh, just That's really awesome. want to thank you for coming and spending the time with us. Hey, it means Brooks, a lot. you and I have spent yeah. a lot of time together. It was an honor to coach with you at Bishop Fian. Same way. Coaching your son. Yeah. You know, it's um, a lot of things. Are, it's football. You know yeah. what I mean? High school level, college football, NFL, there are you know bonds formed that just it just means something when you go through I, I i've always said that you will learn everything you want to know about someone over the course of a football season yeah. because every type of adversity and success they're going to have and so how do they react to that so and we've been through a few together so, it's <laughs> so it looks like you're gonna spend time in uh, new york watching uh Watching your son play up there. Yeah, he's in Ithaca, Florida. Ithaca, go Bombers, man. Yeah, We're upstate New York. Where he's going to go play linebacker up there, and I'm excited for that. Yeah. I also go to Endicott up there to watch Rex play lacrosse. Lacrosse, yeah. Which is super exciting. And TJ just graduated, so. TJ graduated Clemson, <laughs> yeah. He's like, Dad, I want to get out of New England a little bit. I said, you go ahead, son. And he went down <laughs> to South Carolina. and Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. Good for him. Well, Dante's going to do great things up there playing football. He's got a great coach up there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good luck to him. Right. He'll be making hundred tackles a season up there, probably. Be fun. You know, and, and they get lacrosse with Rex. So, yeah. congratulations! Thank you for everything. We got shout outs at the end. Uh, no, uh, uh, shout out to you for coming on. Thank you so much. Uh, it really means a lot. Like especially being at my age, <clears throat> growing up, like seeing you. That's what you guys made New England sports. Like that whole era of the two thousand one to, you know, even two thousand nineteen, whatever. But you guys started that that whole core group of those guys with Thanks. you, Brady, Mankins, all those guys, McGinnis, and uh, it made our childhood, made growing up here what it is to be a sports fan. So yeah, every success that. they still have, I, I have pride that that I was on that one team, and then even even the '96 team, you know, that we went to the Super Bowl yeah. and lost to the Packers. Like that draft was Terry Glenn, Lawyer Malloy, Lawyer Malloy. myself. Yeah. You know, Vinatieri was a free agent there. Chris Sullivan, a North Attleboro yep. graduate, you yep. know, was on that team too. So, I mean, a lot of those guys just trickled down and made it through to the one team, and we're we're a big part of that foundation. So we take pride in. You know, starting starting a lot of the work dynasty. They did. Yeah, Mike, you anything? Yeah, I'm gonna shout out the uh, your uh, charity, That's Teddy's it. team. Teddy's Thanks. team. That's Thanks. awesome. Yeah. So when we started this podcast, everybody was asking me, "Are you gonna get Teddy Bruski on? When are you gonna get Teddy Bruski on?" <laughs> well, we finally finally have him on. We thank you for coming on. My pleasure. My pleasure, yeah. guys. Yeah, you got a nice little. Show. Yeah, we didn't even ask you anything about you know stories about Tom Brady. You know, nothing about that. What is Tom Brady? Boring. Like? Boring. Boring. Yeah. Boring. We'll, we'll have him back. Quarter quarter back. We did it's ask like that. ask me Brady, Hasselbeck, ask, what's yeah. it like to work with him, BC guy, all that stuff. He's okay. So, because I already know, though, I already know you 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 hate quarterbacks. That was a big statement. I don't statement. hate them. On the hate field, them. you hate them. Yeah, Off the field, it's a little something different. He just likes to yeah. hit them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck at everything at ESPN this year. Thank Still with you. Arizona? Still with Arizona, yeah. Bear down. Right. I think I think it's it's time for a bowl game. It's are gonna, you gonna? It's gonna are, happen. Did you uh, do anything in the spring? Did you beat uh, Gronk or anything like that? Or did you? No, I, the, I I lost two spring games in a row, and they kept me kept me away. Yeah, the, the, that's it. That's it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like you. It's like you trying to call the offense. Players are like, it's I'm like not you on calling Bruce offense. You're gonna stay on defense. I know, yeah. as well. <laughs> Teddy, thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Good luck with everything. Good luck with your family, and uh, we'll we'll be seeing you around. Punch drunk, baby. In the words of RG, <laughs> ciao for now. <laughs>